We're here at Vanderbilt University with Rich Milner, who's the Cornelius Vanderbilt Endowed Chair at the Peabody College of Education. Rich, thanks so much for joining us. Honored to be here. Rich, you got your career started as a classroom teacher. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you got started teaching? Uh, absolutely. Uh, I actually always wanted to teach You know, from a, a young a boy growing up. I uh, just was enamored, I think, at some point uh, with what school was and what education uh, was. And so uh, I decided that I wanted uh, to go into education. Uh, and so when I started my work in an historically black institution uh, at, in South Carolina, South Carolina State University, I uh, had outstanding mentors who really uh, uh, sort of uh, adopted me, if you will, uh, as someone uh, who is a first generation college student. You know, my, my parents, uh, really had a very strong uh, sort of uh, expectations related to education. In fact, my dad, uh, who drove a forklift for 38 and a half years, was just very serious about uh, ensuring that I'd be, uh, uh, my, my, my siblings and I would be really strong students. And so uh, school became, you know, that uh, a space for me, uh, especially in the, in the younger grades that I uh, sort of became drawn to. Uh, and so when I decided to uh, go into education, my dad uh, actually was not that excited about it. Hmm. Uh, he really, uh, in fact, his languaging was something like, uh, you're really bright and you know you could do some really, what really bright people do. Uh, not necessarily in that uh, sort of, uh, you know, but the idea was that I should become an attorney or uh, an engineer or something that would sort of earn you know, a lot of money. And what was it that made you decide that teaching was still the thing that you wanted to do, despite your uh, your dad's pleadings? Well, you know, I so I ended up majoring uh, in English uh, as uh, uh, an undergrad graduate, uh, and so I thought I will probably go uh, and perhaps take the LSAT. And and then in about my senior year, I decided, you know, this is my life. I get one of them, uh, and I love you, Pop. <laughs> but that I would, uh, I needed to do what, what made sense for me. And that, for me, was uh, to teach and uh, to be able to, to sort of help, uh, and I think in a lot of ways, be a mentor uh, for, for young people. Uh, and so when I, I, because I was a senior, I ended up having to go and do a fifth year, mm -hmm. um, a master's degree uh, in education. And so I got a master's degree in English education, which uh, meant that I started out, you know, earning a little bit more money than I would have earned with just a bachelor's degree. But it also meant uh, that it sort of placed me uh, in a position such that it was almost like a prove them wrong uh, kind of thing. In other words, like uh, I was going to make education work because I had sort of defied, if you will, uh, my, my dad. And then what was the school where you first taught at? Was it yeah. in South Carolina? Or? Yeah, I, taught, I started teaching at Lower Richland High School uh, in, in South Carolina, and it was, uh, and I started in the middle of the year, so I started teaching in January. And uh, for lack of a better, for lack, lack of better framing, uh, the teacher whom, the, 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 the teacher left in the middle of the year. And so the students with whom I was working, uh, had was, was receiving a new teacher. Uh, they were the students whom no one else wanted to teach. Uh, and so imagine a first year teacher going into an environment and I just thought they were like the, the smartest, the, the most engaging. You know, they taught me so much about what it means to, to teach. That was the real work, you know, uh, if, you, if you will. Uh, and so the first year I think uh, was somewhat of a blur insofar as you know, people were, were working on, you know, engaging novels and they were very much, uh, you know, thinking about the five paragraph essay. And, and I was just trying to build relationships, you know, for the first few weeks of, you know, January. I mean, of course, that became a central theme throughout, you know, teaching. But, you know, when you start in January, you're really starting at the beginning of the year when, you know, a lot of my colleagues had sort of uh, were able to build a, build a foundation. But I maintained a relationship with my, uh, my mentors at, at my undergraduate institution. And they, like my parents, and they, like my dad in particular, really wanted me to, uh, to continue my education, not move outside of education, but they wanted me, they didn't want me to, you know, to, to stop. And so I, I received a note from uh, a mentor 
uh, at, at South Carolina State who said, we're taking a trip, a bus trip from, uh, from our campus to Columbus, Ohio, to, uh, to, for undergraduates to visit the campus. This was my first year teaching, uh, and we, we think you should, should get on the bus. And uh, so I wrote back, and I remember saying, uh, do I have to pay for this for this trip, right? Uh, and she wrote back and said, uh, I remember well, she called back, and we, we, we communicated, and my mentor, who was a professor of English, said, you do have to pay if you want to go, if you want to get on the bus. And I remember being so offended. <laughs> like, how dare you? Uh, how, how you know? How dare you invite me on this invite paid me trip. on this trip? And I have to you know I don't have to pay for it. So anyway, long story short, uh, I I was really uncertain, uh, and uh, as to whether I would actually take the trip to, to Columbus, uh, to the Ohio State University. And I remember it was a, a Wednesday or Thursday, and I said I um I just decided you know I'm I'm going to go. This was maybe March, and I had only been teaching a few months. And I remember driving to driving from Columbia, South Carolina, to Orangeburg, South Carolina, and just sort of reflecting, saying, "What is this thing? I'm, you know, why am I doing this? Why am I getting on the bus?" But if Dr. Favor said it, then there must be something to it. So uh, I decided to, you know, drive, drove down, got on the bus, and I remember reluctantly, get, you know, handing over my like, you know. Seventy-five dollars or whatever, you know, the the fee was to to ride the bus uh, to Columbus, and it was the best thing that could have ever happened uh, to me. When I when I got to Columbus, uh, the the group and there was a sort of a uh, a cadre, a, a large number of folks from across the country, folks of color, people who looked like me, who were uh, many of them in education, and these was, these was these, these were these were folks who were uh, cross disciplines. So you know you had engine, you know pers- perspective engineers, you know, these for, for graduate programs, uh, you know folks in the health sciences, people in humanities, and 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 I remember engaging with uh, the education students uh, and thinking, wow, you're the, the kinds of questions that you're asking and and, pro- and and trying to get your head around are the exact questions. That I'm trying to figure out as a as a as a new a really new uh, teacher, and so uh, I remember making really great connections with the people on the trip. Uh, and then at one point, I met. Uh, so when, when we went to the, the campus, we were uh, to meet with uh, prospective mentors, advisors, and I remember meeting with Gail McCutcheon uh, and Anita Wolf Okoy, who became my my mentors, and. Uh, so we just had the you know the very surface level level conversations about you know why I was interested in the cur- in the curriculum why I was interested in graduate school, and I had a lot of questions about like uh, really I was trying to get tools to be frank with you about what I could take back into my classroom. I mean that was what it was really about, and I remember when I when I uh, when the when the interview or the conversation with Dr. McCutcheon was getting ready to end, and I stood up, and I was getting ready to shake her hand, and she said, give me a hug. <laughs> she said, because um, I got a feeling you'll be back. And she says, you know, you have no idea what your uh, life is going to be, uh, the, the kind of impact you're going to be able to make when you when you decide to take that next step. Isn't that powerful when educators sort of reach out to us and sort of have that imagination for students that sometimes students can't even have for themselves to, to be able to sort of see a version of us that's, you know, grander and bigger and older and wiser than where we're at right now? Absolutely. You know, uh, for me, it was one of those sort of pay it forward moments insofar as uh, I just remember feeling like, Maybe I can do this thing because I, you know, again, I never, uh, I, I never thought I would or even earn a master's degree. So the fact that someone whom I respected as a, uh, you know, a, a, a professor at a place like the Ohio State University would see, uh, and so um, I applied, and I was in Columbus, Ohio, you know, with the full ride and so far forth, uh, the, the very next fall. 
And so your work has then continued to focus on um, kids like the ones that you were teaching um, in South Carolina, um, and in particular, a set of mindsets that educators can bring to their work um, to help them have a toolkit for thinking about equity teaching in classrooms. Can you tell us a little bit about sort of where these ideas of ed educator mindsets came from and sort of how you how you frame them now? Absolutely. Uh, well, I, I would, would like to sort of share just a little bit more about uh, sort of the transition into graduate school. Sure. I, uh, I, I, as I taught, I found myself uh, in spaces where uh, I, I was one of those folks who, you give me a good book uh, and some time and space, and I'm like the happiest, the happiest dude on earth, right? Uh, and so I was, I was really trying to uh, to share, expose our students to good texts, you know, good relevant texts, you know, texts from Toni Morrison and uh, uh, you know, good poetry, you know, Langston Hughes, and uh, I and try I, to share that passion that you have that, for literature. To absolutely, those same because kids. I thought, you know, if 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 I can get them to fall in love with reading, fall in love with literature, you know, that so that I thought. But what I continue going back to was this notion that, uh, and it's what we all know, like if this, if students don't believe you give a darn about them, you give a doggone about them, as my grandmother would say, like they are real talk, not going to engage with you. I don't care how young you are, I don't care what your race or ethnic, or ethnic background happens to be, what your sexual orientation happens to be, you got to be in a place, right? Where your students know you care about them, and so that was like. And less then maybe they'll think about all these books and Absolutely. poems you want them to and read. And it's not something you check off the on the box, right? It's not something that you do and say, oh, "I've done that part." Like it's like it was like this constant engagement, and that was the biggest one of the biggest pieces that I learned from my work. Uh, it was about how do I how do we co-create an ethos, an environment such that everyone, that all of us, are able to to engage in this space and hold. Ways and that was not something that I that I experienced in my own learning, um, in my own teacher education program. And so when I started my work, uh, and so I you know I did the PhD program at the Ohio State, uh, and and I began my career uh, at, here at Vanderbilt, and I started immediately teaching. One of the first courses I taught uh, was a class called Social and Philosophical Aspects of Education. And what it really meant, it was a class, it was a sociology class that was a required course for all of our, um, undergraduate secondary education majors. Everybody who wants to become a teacher, a Everybody secondary wants, teacher. Absolutely. And so, uh, and so I had these, these students in, in, in the class and, uh, and again, just like teaching high school, the, the teacher, the students will tell you, if you listen, Right, and if you're engaged with them, uh, and you you know, and you sort of, you not you, but if one, if we, right, as educators, if we approach our work in ways such that we we understand very deeply uh, that uh, we're not the arbiters of knowledge, that we truly are in spaces where we are learning with the folks with whom we're working. If you listen and you and you're in a, and you're astute, uh, you'll you'll figure out along the way. Uh, what's needed and what's required. So, and what what I what I heard from the, the the teachers. So the class really became, in a lot of ways, like the multicultural checkoff class. I'm just going to be frank, because uh, some of that I embody, you know, as the black guy. Uh, but in other ways, it also was very essential to me because I taught in a in a rural community with almost all black students, and uh, and they. Uh, I would say 95% of them live below the poverty line. And so, uh, and the languaging and, and the discourse that I experienced from the, the, the teacher educate the students in the, in, the, in the college classroom was really uh, one of deficits. They had great intentions. They were, they were, they were good young folks, right, who had good hearts. Uh, but they also, they, they embraced this idea of Achievement gaps, and this idea of achievement gaps, really uh, was uh, uh, consistent with what we know about 
really place, placing the locus of control on students. So if students just worked harder, if, if families just valued education, if, and these were, these were young folks, 18, 19 year olds coming into uh, this classroom, into the teacher education classroom, really believing in their core, right? If things change with the students, then things would get better. Uh, and, what, and so when I wrote Start Where You Are. Start I, Where You Are, which is your first book that you published in 2010. Mm-hmm. And so when I wrote Start Where You Are, uh, But Don't Stay There, I, I was really looking for a text that uh, would do for me what I thought I needed in that class. So I thought, you know, if I could get my 17 or 18 uh, students in this class and my mom to read this book. <laughs> um, and that'd be pretty good. Yeah, that'd be pretty, you know, pre- pretty darn good. And, and the core idea that you were trying to wrestle with was here are these young, mostly white students who are coming into the education profession. And say more about what you mean by deficit thinking. Like, what are some of the characteristics of deficit thinking if we were, wanted to be able to recognize it um, with teachers or education students that we were talking to? Absolutely. So, you know, really focusing on a, in a very fundamental way on what students, people, community uh, don't have, don't bring. Uh, you know, and so when you think about a checking account, right? Uh, you don't want your checking account in the deficit, I can tell you that, right? Or your bank account or whatever. So it's, it's really about the sort of, met- it's, it's really about focusing in on, honing in on uh, either consciously or, or implicitly, covertly, on what communities don't bring into learning environments. And what we, what we know for sure from good science is that when mechanisms are in place to support our young people they succeed and so it was it it was really I really wanted the teachers in our class to think about how they needed to change right uh, in order to build the kind of learning opportunities that would maximize student potential that's great. Um, and so start where you are is sort of organized around this idea of deficit. And does it use the language of asset thinking as the kind of converse of that? Absolutely. Yes. Um, whereas instead of seeing students as and their communities as missing all these things, saying, wow, there's all kinds of funds of knowledge that are here in these communities. There's all kinds of things that we can draw on as strengths to be able to build from. And it's our job as educators both to find to see those in our students to have the same kind of imagination for our students that your mentors had for you um, and then to build the structures that we need for people to be successful. Um, in, in, I don't know if you can, if, I mean, I'm sure you worked with lots of education students and then practicing educators. Um, do you have uh, stories or, or things that you can share with us that are like wh- where you feel like this really clicked, um, where the sort of changes that you saw with people as the ideas from start where you are but don't stay there sort of took root within particular classes or communities or things like that? Absolutely. So well, one of the things that is important to remember, it, Justin, is that when I was uh, – Working with these young folks in uh, in teacher education, I was also conducting research mm-hmm. um, in K twelve classrooms, and so uh, I wanted to make sure I was studying, really looking at um, getting out, getting my head around what it meant for English language arts teachers. To I was an English teacher, uh, but what it what it meant and what it looked like for for English language arts teachers to engage in this work. Uh, that uh, was emancipatory. This work that what I call in in the you know what I now talk about uh, in in my work as opportunity centered uh, teaching, right? Uh, and so I was studying practices in K twelve. I started when I first moved to Nashville, and I started my work in, at Vanderbilt. I was working in high school English classrooms. Uh, and so I did that work for a year. And then what I realized was that I really wanted to think about a trajectory and to think broader. And so I looked, I started uh, my work at a middle school. So I, so I left the high school work, well, you know, I still have those, those data, but I, I began working in, uh, in a middle school, in middle school classrooms. And I actually did some work in, in a social studies classroom. And, you know, uh, I was 
I found myself really trying to hone in on on educators who were successful and who were demonstrating, if you will, the kinds of mindsets that I thought were necessary for them to be successful uh, with children who live below the poverty line, with black and brown children, with children who have quote unquote learning uh, disabilities, with children who uh, who live on the on the side of the tracks that folks would not necessarily believe to be um, germane, right? And I remember uh, there was a moment when uh, there was a shooting that had, had taken place, and it's what I showcase in, in Star Where You Are, the middle school is where I show. And I remember uh, the shooting occurred like on a Thursday, and I was scheduled to be back in the school the following week uh, on a you know Tuesday or Wednesday. And this actually made national news. So. The shooting occurred, and these were three high school students that had gone into this mom and pop shop right around the corner from the middle school. So let me be clear, Justin. The, they, they were, so the shooters were not middle school students, which is where I was working, which is where the, you know, uh, the convenience store but was. It was very close. But, but it was these were high school students, the feeder school. Uh, so three students, they go in, and they actually shot uh, the, the store clerk, and the store clerk died. And so when I got to the campus the following week, uh, on the bus yard, the students were talking about the robbery. Uh, in the corridors, they were talking about the robbery. But when I visited classrooms, uh, and you know, the teachers didn't mention it. You know, uh, first period, second period, third period. When I eavesdropped in, the, as good researchers do, uh, in the cafeteria, uh, in the lunchroom, there was no conversation about the robbery. And I just thought, but the students were talking about in, this and talking about in their hearts and minds. They were trying and they were posing questions like young people do, right? You know, I wonder where they got the, you know, where did they get the the gun? The gun? Why the, did they do this? Right? What, 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 what were they thinking? Them, right? You know, uh, and, but no, uh, you know, no discussion of it in the, in the classroom. And so, as a part of my reciprocity uh, with these teachers who had who had given so much of their time to help me learn about their practices. Uh, I conducted professional development with them from time to time, and so um, during the professional development session, session a few uh, you know weeks later, I just posed a question. One of the questions, and this was not something that was necessarily planned, but I thought, you know, I'll get some good feedback to understand this, and it became the whole professional development session. So uh, I asked, I said, "Hey, you know, I'm wondering why I didn't hear any discussion or any connections." Uh, about the robbery in the cl- in the class, right? Uh, in classes that I observed, uh, and when I say the people in the, the teachers in their room, like all collectively, just countered my question. They were offended. How dare you even pose such a question? And I was trying to get my head around. Wait a minute. Your students are coming in, and they and when you think about their hearts and minds, they're trying to get their heads around what's happened, and you're avoiding it, right? So. Uh, and the kinds of things I, you know, heard were things like, uh, I'm not trained as a counselor. I'm not trained as a social worker. I have a real curriculum to teach, Rich Milner. Go back up there to that university. Uh, you know, all things that I understand and I get to get my, you know, uh, I don't think parents would appreciate our having, you know, my talking about a robbery. Uh, what would the super, all these things that we grapple with as educators, right? Uh, and we grapple with, and we when we miss the opportunity to be uh, responsive to our young folks, right? And so, and then there was a, uh, a a teacher who, if I set my computer up on the left side of the library, he sat on the right side of the library, as far away from me as possible. If I set my computer up on the right side of the library, He's on he the left sat side. on the left side of the library, as far away from me as possible. He never said one word to me the entire time uh, I was conducting my research in the in the school. I remember one day. This may be a little bit of a tangent, but I'm going to tell it anyway. Uh, I remember one day I was uh, standing by the door, and I because I thought he's going to talk to me. Everybody likes me, right? <laughs> and when he realized what I was doing, he went back to the, to, the, to his table and set his laptop up. He just would not engage with me. But on this day, he raised his hand. He said, "You know," and, and I was like, "Come with it. I want to hear what you have to say." Right? Uh, he said, "And furthermore, I teach math, you know, and science. What in the world?" Does a pathetic robbery 
have to do with my teaching math and science, right? And so the, the, the sort of focal area of the professional development was, you know, ways to build the curriculum to be responsive to young people. So I said, well, let's think about it for a moment. I said, what if you had your young people, your students, um, oh, one, one more thing I need to add. Mm-hmm. And then there was one teacher who said to me, uh, who said, and the robbery won't show up on the test. That's the real deal of what we're grappling with you know, in in schools. Teachers are under an enormous amount of pressure to teach the test, an enormous amount of accountability pressures, right, Uh, that might seem tangential to what the real curriculum is supposed to be. That's, I mean, it's a great summary you have of all of these different voices expressing a whole bunch of the things that are central to teachers thinking that, you know, what's the assessment and the accountability? What yes. am I sort of trained to do? What's my role as a teacher versus my role with as a person with relationships with students? What's my particular curriculum? And it's just a great sort of overview of ways in which people um, – uh, you know, find ways to push back against some of these ideas of, um, you know, equity teaching and culturally responsive teaching. But you're up there, you're in front of them, you've heard all their concerns, and then what'd you say? Absolutely. Uh, well, the first thing is I wanted to acknowledge uh, to the teachers that I hear them, and I understand that while we can be critical of their practices, the reality is I work at the university. And I can come in and be critical and go about my life. But I, but I really try sincerely to empathize with, to uh, honor uh, the folks in those communities and their real experiences. But the question that the, the teacher posed, the, the math and science teacher posed, was a real serious one, right? What in the world does a pathetic robbery, I'll never forget it, have to do with, with math and science? And so I said, one of the, one of the criticisms in the newspapers uh, was that there had taken the responders uh, too long to get, or they, you know, they were questioning the number of minutes it had taken the, the police and the, the ambulance to get to the robbery site. Right? I said, so what if you had, they had all this great technology in the school. So I said, what if you asked the, the, the teachers to, the, you, pulled up, you pulled up Google Maps and you guesstimated the amount of time it'd take the robbers, to, to the, the responders to get from, the, from their site to the, uh, to the robbery site. There's some math in that, right? Uh, there are probably some standards embedded in that. Distance, rate of speed, uh, you know, all these mathematical uh, and I said that might even show up on the uh, on, on the, the test, test right? Yeah. You know, uh, you know, train A leaves the station at you know <laughs> at at one time driving a particular rate of speed. You know, so uh, and they kind of come. You know, they, I, I got them to smile a little bit when I shared that story. I said, or what if you had the the on a on a very basic level, crime had been a concern in the community. I said, what if you asked the the uh, the students to to measure or to count the number of street lights in the community and to uh, to look at data uh, regarding well-lit spaces versus spaces that are not as well-lit and look at correlation like are there more robberies or are there more is there more crime in spaces that are more that are lit in comparison you know there are some there are some data points there there's some math there I said what if you had uh, the students think about uh, uh, communities that have decent paying jobs in comparison to communities that don't have decent paying jobs and and what crime rates are in those communities i mean these are the kind what if you you know how long does it take people to get to the bus or to 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 public transportation to get to decent paying jobs all of these questions that our young people are, are are probably thinking about Right, but we we choose, or we may choose, not to engage in schools or the kinds of. Schools. And so I and I, and I, and I was able to sort of talk about probability, and I was able to talk about you know uh, distance and rate of speed and all of the things that we're supposed to be teaching anyway. As an English teacher, you came up with all this. As an English teacher, right? Uh, but again, and it's not that math teachers. Uh, don't want to teach rate of speed, right? Or math, or math teachers don't want to teach probability. But if you're going to connect with young people, you've got to connect with young people where they are, right? And you have to help them understand. And so the, the point was not that they teach a robbery, right? The point was that you teach, you know, the standards you teach 
concepts, ideas, right, that connect to the human spirit, that connect to with who who young people are. And then I said, what if, right, the math teacher actually talked to the ELA teacher? Imagine that, right? If we if we set up, you know, learning, if we set up, you know, teaching spaces where uh, young people, where teachers could engage with each other, right? And I said, what if, you know, the the, the literacy teacher, the, the English language arts teacher were to ask her students to write a letter at the time our police chief was Ronald Surpass to say, here are the things that we found in our community and draw from data. You know, there have been, you know, X number of robberies in our community and to not only outline what the issues are, but to talk about some of the potential strategies. So while you're gentrifying all these areas and you're moving in and pushing people out, and you know, those are the kinds of quant conversations that I and we didn't and the the level of gentrification was nowhere near what we find today but those are the kinds of but all the projections were there but those are the kinds of the of ways that we are able to connect and these are when you talk about deficits students are coming in with these questions mm -hmm. so so using the questions the assets the the ideas the 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 the, the, the areas that pique our young folks interests as an anchor to good teaching is what I was trying to convey to those people in service. And they became uh, really powerful examples for what I was able to try to convey when I was uh, engaging with uh, the young people in teacher education programs. You know, what's great about that is sort of a challenging moment where you're challenging people to think more deeply and then also other stories in which it's like, and, and then they did this, or I don't, did you ever, did you ever hear back? What did those folks do afterwards? Uh, <laughs> well, I don't <laughs> like know. Kept doing sure. whatever doing. <laughs> I hope they made a, I hope they made a difference. But, but one of the things that I did find was that the young, uh, I hope they shifted, shifted their practice. Uh, but one of the things I did find was the the gentleman who never would talk to me started talking to me after that, right? He started asking me questions and for uh, for you know references and uh, you know tools and resources that he might be able to incorporate in into his work. So uh, one part of that story is that when you really listened to teachers who were pushing back on you um, and you took their concerns seriously and you took them as coming from a place of professionalism, that kind of opened them up to being able to say, okay, this Rich Milner guy, you know, he's, he's pushing some ideas that I might, that might not align with my thinking right now, but he's really listening to me as I'm responding to them. And that creates an opportunity for dialogue with our colleagues and, and invites people into the conversation. Yeah, I think so. And I also think, uh, I believe when when you're in the midst of doing the work, it can be challenging to think about innovative, outside of box uh, uh, ways of connecting content with students. Uh, when and so and you need critical partners. You need we all need people to push and also show us possibilities. You know, related to what could be, and so that's part of what I think professional development can do, uh, and that's also part of what I try to do when I am engaging with with educators in a very serious way. Because let me tell you something, like for, for our children, for our students, like it's a matter of life and death for many of them. So, you know, standing up, lecturing, standing up, uh, engaging with young people in the way that you teach your own children, the way that you learn, you as, a, as an educator, like that's not good enough. It's not. Like you've got to teach the folks in front of you. And so, like being very, uh, you know, compassionate and and open to, to to teachers about where they are, like is part of it. But it's also like pushing. Like you can't stay there. Like if you if you're committed to these folks in front of you, and like that's why I get like completely like very very serious. Then you got to do some things differently. If you if you're teaching, you know, fourth grade. Uh, and your children are not reading on the fourth grade level, guess what? You, your children can't do independent study, right? You've got to teach, right? And so it doesn't matter if 70% of your, of your students in, in the class get it, right? If those 30 don't, your responsibility is to teach and to bring those, those, those 30% 
uh, you know, where they need to be in ways that they that they're whole, that they understand that they uh, have value, that they understand their own uh, uh, identity spaces in ways that uh, can be transformative. And so, when we talk about the framework, uh, I but when when I was able to pull together those five tenets. Th- these were like the five anchors that I thought if t- if I could get teachers to understand this as a foundation for what it means to to be innovative, for what it means to be responsive, uh, then we have a better shot. We have a good chance, a better chance uh, at the kinds of of uh, uh, classrooms where, where where students want to be. You know. So asset and deficit thinking is one of those five tenets that we try to, you know, and I think what you just said actually is really helpful because it's not about erasing all notions of deficit from your mind. At some point we notice there are 30% of my kids who are not on grade level and that's something that I have to do with it, but I cannot always see those 30% of the kids. They can't just be the kids who aren't on grade level. They have to be these kids who have all of these assets and strengths and speak second languages, speak more languages than I do, um, have cultural funds of knowledge they bring, and I need to work with them on reading. Um, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Part of their identity. But asset and deficit is one of this sort of five-part framework that you have around educator mindsets. Can we talk about the other four sort of sure. briefly? Um, what's What was the second one that you worked on or what's sort of after after asset and deficit thinking, what was the next one that, that caught your attention and interest? Right. And so uh, I don't know want to talk about these linearly, yeah. Lee, but uh, linearly, linearly, uh, <laughs> but I, I do want to uh, to suggest that they are interrelated. Uh, mm-hmm. And you know, one of them was related to this notion of race uh, and and color blindness. And so, when you start talking to teachers, to educators, uh, many of whom are in the professional because they they have good hearts, uh, they they chances are they know they aren't gonna be, get wealthy. You start talking about race and emotionally charged, you know, issues related to to race. People get very offended, uh, and uh, and so, but it's but it's so necessary. If you look at every indicator uh, in education, to do analyses, deep analyses, and to advance the work, uh, and not have a race as a uh, uh, as a factor, as a, as a variable, or whatever, however you choose to talk about your research. Uh, and your work, I think, is uh, is borderline. Uh, uh, I want to say it's borderline malpractice, right? Um, and not to pathologize the work we're doing with, with young people, but uh, you know, just imagine an oncologist not studying an aspect of cancer because that oncologist feels it, it doesn't make the oncologist feel good. It makes the oncologist feel uneasy. Forget that. Like this work is raced, and if you're going to do uh, work that is emancipatory, if you're going to engage work that is transformative, if you're going to engage work that meets the needs of every young person with whom you work, then you've got to consider race. And so, as a part of the framework, uh, race becomes uh, one of the tenets. Uh, what we know from good science, for instance, is that uh, students' racial and ethnic uh, identity, so their sense of racial and ethnic identity is, is strongly linked to their performance. So in other words, if I feel strongly about my own racial and ethnic identity, I do better. Not when I hate people outside of my racial and ethnic identity, but when I feel strongly about my own. And you know, one of the things that I that I always say, and, and uh, you know, and I used to say it was, uh, you know. Uh, like a conspiracy theory, but as I've as I've as I've tried to really test and look deeply about why white students are are performing at higher rates on these on these tests that are predetermined by a human being, right? Uh, then you know we we feed white students all the time with with positive feedback about who they are. So white students walk in confident. They walk in, you know, with seeing with, themselves in the seeing curriculum. Seeing themselves reflected and, in the curriculum, seeing themselves embodied in the teachers, you know, in the language in the language that's used, the discourse, the the jokes that's told. It's all, you know, they're privileged, they're advantaged just when they walk just by virtue of walking into the space. And so uh and, and so in in other words, race and colorblindness is one tenet. I could go on and on and on mm-hmm. about, about each of them. Good. But, uh, um, so and the summary of it is sort of we want to um, 
that when educators shy away from acknowledging the importance of race in their work, when they, they bring a colorblind perspective, that often doesn't lead to work that's as sophisticated, as real, as meaningful as when they take seriously the notion that um, people in schools have different racial identities and we have to be able to talk about and think about those racial identities and, and ways in which um, sort of racist practices, racist structures may be affecting um, their learning. So the so the, the framework in general, right, is is this notion that it, when when educators don't embrace, when they don't understand, and then when they when they have a colorblind or a race neutral mindset, they contribute to opportunity gaps. So the the framework is around the, the these tenets that I outline here actually contribute to teachers' uh, perpetuation and their, their uh, contributions to opportunity gaps. And so the next part of the framework, we had deficit thinking, we had colorblindness. Yes, uh, and so uh, a third tenet you know, related to this work really is about uh, what I call myth of meritocracy, right? And, and it is a sociological uh, construct that we've known a lot about. But a lot of, my young, a lot of the young people, a lot of the, the teachers with whom I was working who were learning to teach, they actually... Uh, adopted or they came in with this this fallacy right this notion that they uh, that they'd earned and their families had earned their sort of rightful place of privilege uh, and so I I really had to sort of disrupt and help them understand how systems uh, sort of perpetuated you know the status quo so you know I would give an example for instance about how uh, generationally, you know, wealth is passed down, let's say, from one generation to the next. Uh, and so that, I think, was a really important space, uh, and it is an important space for young people to think about socioeconomic status, to think about poverty, and to think about poverty not as a, uh, a sort of descriptor, of a descriptor or uh, a way of describing people as much as it is a condition. And then when those young teachers get those ideas, how do you hope they implement them in their classroom? Like when, it, when a teacher ha is doing work to, to give up on the myth of meritocracy, like what does that teacher look like in a different way in their classroom as they grow in this work? I think that's a, a very important question because I think some people misuse the, not misuse, but they don't, actualize the framework in ways that I think they really could. But most, most of the time what happens when people engage the tenants uh, is they will say, oh, wow, you know, I got my, my team to really talk about race or I got my, my, my team to really reflect about uh, deficit mindsets, right? This work is about how do you transform your teaching, right? So I want you to talk about race, but I also want you to, uh, to think about how instructionally you're going to build instructional tools to talk about racial inequity, how you're going to build instruction. So what that means for, for, let's say, a social studies teacher is, you know, very, very easily you can talk about how uh, neighborhoods are organized and how they've historically been organized to, to maintain the status quo. Uh, you can talk in, in mathematics about how historically particular groups of people have uh, uh, been denied loans and what it means to, to be given uh, inequitable uh, interest rates on how, I mean, the, 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 yeah, the sky the cost is the of a mortgage in one neighborhood versus the Absolutely, cost of a mortgage right. in another. You know, kind of so if you think about like, there, there are so many ways to think about this work beyond just having a conversation, right? Uh, uh, and so when you talk about meritocracy, you can look historically at how wealth is passed along long from one generation to the next and how uh, these systems are in place in a lot of ways to maintain the status quo. So these are concretized examples about what it means and young people know implicitly that something is going on, right? So, you know, this, this idea that somehow we are holding something, you know, uh, uh, over or we're keeping something from young people that they don't quite understand. Well, using the, using uh, the classroom space starting at a young age to really help young people think about how they can address uh, and really disrupt uh, these systems, uh, if you will, is, is really what the framework is trying to get at. And that's what I call opportunity-centered teaching 
uh, moving away from the opportunity gaps. Is it, is it helping that, you know, that one ultimate aim is helping students imagine themselves as people who can make change in these structural Absolutely. inequalities that they, be, they, they, through their teachers, they've learned both how to understand them and then some tools for thinking about how do we change and make better the world around us. Absolutely. Okay, there are two more tenants and I want to make Absolutely. sure we get a chance to talk Absolutely. about them. Uh, and so a, a, sec, a, a fourth tenant is uh, what's known as context neutral mindsets. And so uh, in, its, in its simplest form, teachers are teaching in a particular place at a particular time or particular people. And so, uh, you know, going into spaces and really thinking about what the work means uh, in an urban, in urban school context might look qualitatively different than uh, in an environment uh, that's rural or a suburban community, right? And so, uh, really teasing out and peeling back, not in a in a stereotypical way, but really in a in a build. Let me help, let me build my tool kit way, right? To understand that if I'm working in a rural community, I've got to understand the history of that place. I've got to work with the with the community to deeply understand not only what I read in the newspapers, but to understand that everything has an historical arc. That everything that every community has uh, a history that is is central and germane to what it means to do community. So context neutral mindset, the opposite of that is really context centered and a context centered approach, right? Which means that uh, when you think about, and I'll use like the closing of schools, let's say across this country, across this nation, right? And people, you know, rationalize and say, well, you know, it's a, the, the building is dilapidated or the, the you know, the, the enrollment is down, right? What does that mean for community when we when when we shut down the schools or when libraries are not in those spaces or when you know so really thinking very deeply uh, on a a sort of structural way, but also on on in terms of a micro level, like what does it mean to teach in this place right now in a way that would be different from teaching some other place, some other community who exactly are my kids, the families that were here, how do I know about them beyond and and how it's you know one way I've heard it said is not just. It's not just that I teach math, which you do, but you teach kids math. Um, and those, each of those kids is different, has a particular background, and we've got to find ways of sort of weaving um, where they come from and where they're living and what they care about and what's going on in their community into math or science or social studies. Absolutely, and I would add to that, but you know, this also, when, you're, when your young people leave that school, those four walls, and they walk home, you know, what, are they, what are they walking to and through? Right. That's what understanding the context and understanding the community and the ecology of this of the place really is about. Right. And and uh, and so that's the the fourth a fourth uh, tenant of the framework. And then uh, understanding cultural conflicts is the last uh, tenant of the of the framework. And I tease race out of the out of culture because if what I found was that when we when we talk about culture, when we talk about cultural practices, uh, we tend to talk about cultural practices, and we'll talk about language all day. We'll talk about religion. Uh, we might, uh, you know, talk about, uh, you know, uh, different value systems and so forth. And race would be left out as, you know, either superficially engaged or not talked about at all. And so. When I developed the framework, I really wanted to make sure race was – because I would argue that race is probably the most important aspect of the work we do when we talk about uh, engaging um, uh, inequitable uh, practices. So your argument was that if like, schools, teachers in schools, feel more comfortable – talking about some elements of diversity over others, that we find ways to talk about religious diversity or language diversity or other kinds of things, and then there's a special taboo in America about race. Um, and it's inauthentic to talk about some of these other cultural differences without including you know, sort of how race is interwoven among those kinds of things. Is that the, the way to understand the, Absolutely. the fifth dimension? Mm-hmm. Um, can you, in the, in the places that have done the 
in your view, the best, most exciting work with these educator mindsets when they're weaving together asset framing, opportunity centered thinking, um, thinking about, uh, you know, allowing race to be a central part of the conversations that's happening amongst teachers with students in schools. Um, what do some of those changes look like? What, 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 are, what are some of the stories that get you most excited about continuing doing this work? Right. Yeah. So uh, one of the things I want to say about um, cultural conflicts just before we, we move on is that uh, sometimes when we talk about culture, we talk about culture as something that is ingrained in a person. And I, I want to be clear here that a lot of what I talk about and what I've found to be most useful in this work is when we talk about cultural practices, right? Because cultural practices... What what can happen is teachers can build their toolkit, right? They can become more astute at understanding issues of equity, of understanding diversity, uh, and 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 somehow think they've sort of taken, you know, big steps forward. Uh, but they have to understand that it is it, this work never ends and it's ongoing. And so you know, it's just like just because I learn how to speak Spanish, right, doesn't mean I, I don't know, I'm a part of the culture. Does that make sense? So, as a cultural practice, I might I might be able to speak Spanish, but that, but folks might not. The people in that community may see me still as an as an outsider, right? So that piece is very important. What it's about understanding, adapting, and or finding appropriate ways for you to engage in other parts of that culture to think about, you know, which uh, um, you know traditions do I want to participate in, and you know, the the La Rambla, the afternoon walk in Spanish culture, or um, you know, and it may not even be for you, another. and it may not even be, uh, it may be even inappropriate for you to move into that space. It is, but the point is for you to really, as educators, for us really to understand, embrace, uh, and uh, to create the kinds of environments such that people feel whole, people, students feel like their, uh, their cultural practices are accepted and, and allow them to be who they are and not have to check so much of who they are at the door when they walk into schools. Schools are created to do exactly what they're doing, and that is to maintain the status quo for white people. And so, uh, you know, really disrupting that is what's necessary to uh, for us to for us to see change. So, what I've come to what I've come to uh, to understand about what's necessary uh, in schools that do opportunity centered uh, teaching or opportunity centered. Uh, 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 education. Uh, those are schools that uh, really rely on work towards collective tenets, collective orientations, collect a collective vision, if you will, for what it means to do the work. Uh, we can go, you know, you walk into any school, any school, and someone is going to point out the social justice teacher, right? Because those teachers go in their classrooms, they shut their door. And they do their work. Do social justice in four walls on their own. Right. And what, what, what's necessary is for us to really rethink what it means to do. Why do we continue doing what we've done in the past uh, when it's not working? That leads for, to inequitable outcomes that doesn't serve all of our students well. Right, absolutely. And so that's what we find. I, you know, we find that uh, because, it's been, because schools are, have operated and operated the way they have for so many years that we don't believe they should change because it's the way we were educated. But, you know, we're going to find ourselves in a holding pattern. You know, I don't speak in definitive language often because of the kind of science this is, but I can tell you for sure that if we continue doing what we've done in the past, we're not going to see uh, huge shifts. Take, for instance, black students represent about 18% of the general population in schools across the country. But they represent 40%, 40%, over 40% of those students who experience outside of school suspension. Mm -hmm. Just just think about that just for a moment, right? Uh, and, you know, there's, there's sometimes this sort of fallacy, like, related to, oh, we don't know what's going on, or, right? What's going on is some bad teaching is happening. Right, and those students' experiences, those students' uh, humanity is being pushed out of those spaces because they don't fit into whatever this normative way of being uh, that has been created uh, for them. And so, when you think about 
uh, schools that really work to disrupt. You know, we think about ways of healing, and some people call it restoration, restorative, you know, justice practice. But what I know, whether I, whether it's called restorative, whether it's called what I know that has to happen is that schools have got to become places that are spaces of healing, spaces where people can be whole, where people, where, where young people can feel like they actually matter. Uh, in these environments, and that's not necessarily what's happening. Take, for instance, uh, this 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 one example, right? What we find is that uh, black and brown students, and this is from research from Russ Skiba, who is a, a white male, a uh, white person who uh, is on faculty at Indiana University, and what he and his research what uh, he and his research team have found is that black and brown students are referred to the office for what's known as subjective infractions, right? Vis-a-vis, you're, you're too loud. And we see this really uh, intensifying with, with girls, with black girls. You're too loud. You're disrespectful. White students are referred to the office for what's known as objective infractions. Those are infractions like I look at my digital clock, you're supposed to be here at noon, it's 12.05, and that's an objective infraction. And this happens time and time again. We look at the data, we see that uh, black students are, are receive harsher punishments for the exact same offense, right? And so we, what we see is we see a very clear school-to-prison pipeline. What happens in prisons, right? And in, 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 in broader society, vis-a-vis, which shows up in prisons, uh, tends is, is exact is in, in very similar ways what we find in schools. And so my my point is, if we're serious about like disrupting this, we can, right? Uh, this I this this notion that oh this is so complex and we just don't know how to figure, we just choose not to, right? We have enough great science to uh, to figure out how best to respond to our young people. Well, I think what's so powerful about your contribution is that these educator mindsets give us a map and a blueprint of some of this territory. I think part, you know, what, so much of what's important and powerful about what you've offered is um, that if we do want to have communities of teachers that are collectively embracing the challenge of creating schools that are healing and whole places for all students, um, if the starting point is, well, I'm not sure how I do that, we say, well, here are these five educator mindsets. Here are five conversations that we can start having. Here are five sets of practices that we can start engaging in that can lead us towards um, this really important work of having schools that are not on a school to prison pipeline, but having schools um, you know, that, that create the kinds of opportunities that you described at the beginning of this interview where there are a whole bunch of people in your life um, who saw the talent, who saw the opportunity in you and helped open a series of doors. And we want all teachers to be doing that for all kids. Rich Milner, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. Thank you, Justin.